Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another live session. As always, thank you so much for being here. Um, I checked the numbers today, and this is live session 155. Um, so I really want to think about uh, doing something special next week. I'm going to do something unique. Again, I don't know why in my mind the 156 number is a fun number of times to go live but you know the reality is is that that's three full years of going live and i don't know i just think it's a cool accomplishment um i still well i can't really even remember going back to the first live sessions but i remember the stress and anxiety of making sure the setup was perfect and things were gonna go well and and they naturally just kind of did and that's what's allowed me to keep going for this extreme length of time so um it's just always cool to be able to come back and do these lives every week and, and always have people show up and you know there's been ebbs and flows since i've been going live but um yeah it's it's been such a journey and so i appreciate everybody being here so next week it'll be 156 lives and so for that three year mark we'll or three full years of live we'll we'll do something fun um, so let's dive in uh, as you're coming into the session. Um, just always the warm and fuzzies. You can see me. You can hear me. Uh, let me know where you're visiting from. And in our downtime today, we're going to dive a little bit more into the negotiation stuff. But as always, these live sessions are Q&As. Uh, so as you're coming into the Q&A, again, anything and everything is on the table. But Obviously, just seeing that first comment that you can hear and see me is always a nice, warm and fuzzy. Thank you, Brad, for that. Okay, cool. Okay, so let's just take a moment uh, to talk about yesterday's video. I always want to go backwards before we go forwards. So yesterday's video was a behavioral question focused on customer empathy. Um, it's a sourced googliness and leadership question that um, has been shared by multiple clients of mine. And so definitely a video worth checking out. There's a couple of key pieces there. Showing some sort of empathy in the job interview, getting some sort of question around empathy or where you had to demonstrate empathy, whether it's with an internal customer, external customer, et cetera, a relatively high likelihood. So definitely watch that video. Um, it's also a little bit of a tricky question because it's a question that comes with lots of follow-up questions. And that's just always tricky in job interviews is to figure out, okay, so I get this question, but they pose a lot of follow-up questions to me right away. Um, that's always going to be a case where you're going to want to get all the follow-up questions written down. So not just the initial question, but the follow-up questions. And you're probably going to want to take your time to just craft a great answer because those follow-up questions are really, it's an indication of what they're looking for in the answer. Um, and again, like a typical really tricky question might be like a Google GCA question. Some of those interviewers actually will ask you the question, then ask you all the follow-up questions too. That's really tricky to get all that down. So um, do your best, but any question that's longer and or a question that has a question and follow-up questions, do your best to get everything written down. It will make a big impact. But if you didn't have a chance to check out that video yesterday, I was really short. Also, for anybody who did happen to watch that video, um, I had a little editing hiccup. And so for the first half hour it was live, it was uh, the first like 30 seconds were black. So um, I went back and, and fixed that immediately. So hopefully that didn't impact too many people. Um, it's part of the YouTube journey is making some mistakes sometimes, and that's okay. Okay. Let's do a quick prompt of my services, and then we're going to dive right into questions. As always, in the downtime, we're going to talk about the subject area, how to negotiate your job offer, but we really want to focus in on Q&A, and I show up every week to have as much impact as I can for as many people as I can, so everything's on the table. If this is your first time here, my name is Jeff H. Seip. I go live 9 a.m. Pacific time every single Tuesday and new original content every Monday. I offer a bunch of services, one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions, that's really resume, LinkedIn, networking, one-on-one -on -one interview, coaching sessions, and one-on-one -on -one negotiation sessions. Also have our interview mastery course. If you use the coupon code GREEN just today to 11.59 Pacific time, 200 bucks off of our interview mastery course. And then same 
coupon code. It will actually show up as a promo code for our AI app. We eclipsed, I think we're approaching, we're getting close to that 1,000 user number, which is a really, really cool number. Now, the tool, the app, it it's free to start. You can practice a few questions, um, but we're really approaching some good numbers, getting some good feedback. And of course, we're going to continue to iterate and improve upon that tool. And I just want to flag something really quickly. Um, the lifetime offer is going away. We're going to update that if we haven't already. I, I have a chance to check before the session. But the lifetime offer, if you go in and you want to purchase that, um, that's just going to run through the end of May. And we'll be doing some reminders of that as well, because a bunch of people purchased that package knowing that it probably wouldn't exist forever. Let's dive in. Um, if you like what I'm doing today, smash that like button. If you've never subscribed, consider subscribing and we'll get through some stuff. Um, and all questions are on the table. Thanks so much. And thank you for that, Brad, again. Uh, it's always nice to get that warm and fuzzy. Um, so always helpful. Okay, not a question, but I wanted to thank you for all the content. It helped me so much to get an offer and negotiate it to get an improvement on the original offer. Okay, amazing. Congrats. Again, it's always it's always so nice to have people come back in and say, hey, it's doable, it's viable. Sometimes, sometimes these interviews, these companies, everything can seem really far away, but then we get in, we do it, we have success, and it's just an amazing feeling. So congrats and thank you so much. I always appreciate when people come back, whether it's they come back to the live and let me know, they send me a LinkedIn message, they send me an email, they do a LinkedIn post. And by the way, like, Maybe I'll push that a little bit. Anybody who wants to do a LinkedIn post highlighting my content, I mean, that's always greatly appreciated. Hope you get stomach to negotiate a second offer, Kevin. On I couldn't, unfortunately. Okay, so let's go back to Kevin's then. Hey, Jeff, perfect timing for this video. You have a call with a Google recruiter in 30 minutes to review a secondary offer for an L5 TPM role. Okay, Kevin, you have to have to have to go baller on the equity on a tpm these roles have gone up in terms of comp significantly over the last three years i mean i've seen some crazy offers um you're kind of public with your information here so like obviously i want to protect your confidentiality but in a secondary in a secondary round even if they say best and final you really want to push and say, I think we're really close. And I want to recognize and acknowledge that you've said best and final. If we can just add 40K in equity over four years, I'd be willing to sign the offer. So to best and final, we got to do a few things. Um, and again, we don't know if, if you're there yet or not. L5, usually you'll have maybe, well, it really depends on the recruiter, but you'll have like two or three back and forth. Um, but at best and final, if we get into that scenario, and it's just a great scenario to talk about at any company, we acknowledge that we've heard best and final. If we ignore it, we're not using like normal human communication. So I want to acknowledge that I heard when you said best and final, and I think we're really close. Don't say but, say and. And is an additive. But is a downer and is a positive, typically. So and I think we're really close. If you can just add 75K in equity to the total offer, I'll sign. So something where you're acknowledging and then you go for the close is going to be critical. But L5 TPMs, I mean, obviously it's market dependent and I don't want you to share anything you don't want to share. Um, but, you know, definitely when we're talking about the premium plus markets or premium markets, I mean, total comp should be into the 400s. No question. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, the 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 user numbers are great, right? Like the the thing you look for in an app is you look for um you look for people to not only sign up but truly use it and that's the thing we want to push for. We want to push people to use it cuz we know the benefits. And not all of that always has to do with the tool or product, right? Um Anything that we put effort into, we're going to have tremendous success. And so effort, time, energy 
usually translates to better results. And so I always even tell people who get my one-on-one coaching, for example, they're already in such a good place. They've decided to invest their time and money. And that's really important. Like anything where you have a little bit of stake in the game, uh, it's going to be critical to your success. Okay. I think we're congratulating somebody else, but that's okay. Um, Good to see. I can't seem to get past the hiring managers lately. Yeah. And, you know, again, I just want to double down on a hiring manager tip or trick. I can't guarantee that it's going to work. And not everybody loves this advice, but when meeting with hiring managers, again, the default mode should always be you're trying to find out more about them as a person, get them talking specifically about themselves, get them just chatting about themselves, what they love about the company, the role, the team, the projects. Um, I believe one of the biggest challenge areas, in my opinion, is that the lack of asking hiring managers about themselves and getting to talk about themselves is a key missing piece of the puzzle. And the major reason why is that all the data and science, all of it, 100% validates that people like you more when they talk about themselves. And so the default listening mindset is absolutely un believable in the job interviews and it's not to say jim whether you've been not doing that it's just a recommendation for the entire community and audience that tapping into talking allowing other people to talk about themselves especially when we think about questions and i know we talk about this quite a bit when we talk about questions at the end of the interview if you're talking about what do you love what do you love what do you love and that's all they're talking about at the end of the interview i mean Think about the psychology of that, right? It's pretty simple psychology. It's love, love, love. They're talking about themselves and then they end the interview and then they love you and then they want to hire you. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, so no, can't get to the hiring manager past the recruiter. The callbacks are so few. One in one in 68 so far from apps. Okay, so let's talk about that. Um. I I want to, well, let's go back. Let's go into your next comment. Sorry. Yeah, apps equal application. Sorry for the abbreviation. And yeah, and again, again I, I got it, but I always recommend, again, just in general communication, written and verbal communication, no abbreviations, at least the first time around. Just helps people understand. That's all. Um, but let's, let's talk about one in 68. Like, of course. Do I want you to track the number of applications, track where you applied, what the role was? 100%. I want you to track everything. But what I have noticed, and Jim, this is just a general comment, is I've noticed applications starting to become it's a terrible terminology, but it's like a badge of honor. It's like I applied to 200 jobs and I didn't get any roles or I applied to 500 jobs and I didn't get any roles. Well, there becomes a time where applying just doesn't make sense then, right? So if you're one for 68 in applications, I would say don't apply for the rest of the week. Spend all your time just focusing in on networking, reconnecting with former colleagues, building relationships and don't apply to any additional roles this week because applying is really not the way to get a job. Now, I I understand that it's low hanging fruit and people really don't like when I say don't apply. Sure, apply for jobs, especially if you think you're a good fit and it's, it's really maybe easy to get into the company. By the way, if you are going to apply, apply on the company's website always skip all the third parties, go right to their website and their careers page. If you can apply there, that's my recommendation. But, but I just see a lot of applications. And again, we just have to say to ourselves, okay, well, we've done this strategy over and over and over again, it's not working. So it's just an opportunity to change it up. Maybe don't stop applying altogether, but take a few days off of applying and start networking. Let's talk about one sneaky trick. For networking, it's not really sneaky is the wrong word. It's like a, just a very viable option. When was the last time anybody who's watching right now gave a LinkedIn recommendation to somebody? 
could we be a little bit strategic about who we give that LinkedIn recommendation to? Like somebody working at a company maybe that we want to work at? Of course. It's still a good play, but LinkedIn recommendations can be a great networking strategy because you're reconnecting with somebody you used to work with and you're obviously giving them a recommendation because you like them. It's a really, really, it's a trick that I just haven't seen other people using. And again, it's all positive. By the way, if you don't like writing recommendations, just ask ChatGPT to write a recommendation. These are the four things I love about Sue. Boom, 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 boom. Help write, help me write a five sentence LinkedIn recommendation for Sue. Uh, just that simple. Uh, I hope that helps. I know that was long winded, um, but anyway, I hope it helps. Jeff had an interview where the HR manager asked for my number. I did not give it to them, but she mentioned she would like me to send my range. I don't know if that's le legal in CT. How do I respond? I would really like them to give the offer first. Okay, so I think we have some follow-up questions. Um, I would want you to, I don't know what the laws are in CT. Um, that's Connecticut, by the way, for people. In New England, everything CT, R-I-M-A, that's just the way it works. Um, so yeah, I would, I would just quickly look it up and say, um, look up in Connecticut if, if a salary range is not provided in the job description, if it should be, you should note that to them. But also if in Connecticut, they have to ask if they have to provide a salary range of asked for it, right? So in a lot of states now, not a lot of states, but a number of states like in California where I live, like if they don't post it on the job description, which they legally are obligated to do, if I say, hey, tell me the salary range for that role and they say, I don't know. That's also a legality issue. And you can note it. You can just say, hey, like California law, like you're supposed to have the salary range on the job description and you're supposed to be able to provide it when asked for it. Look, I get it. Maybe you're not in control of those things. I just wanted to share that information with you. And lastly, if you feel like you've got to get to this place where you provide a range, it's not a range, it's a number. Ranges are the absolute worst. I think it's the worst piece of negotiation advice that's ever been given in the history of negotiations. I am adamant about this. If you give me a range of 80 to 100K, I heard 80K only. You're willing to take 80K. So there's so much guidance on ranges. You'll hear ranges from some of the biggest job experts out there. Whatever the lowest number is, that's the number I'm going to take. So I like a number better. And I don't like really like round numbers, like 100K. I'd ask for $107,450. It means I've done all the math and I've really thought about what is that exact number that I need to make. It's psychology. And so I think some of the fun, one of the most enjoyable parts about my journey, and of course I share some of my journey in these lives, is that I've really realized that almost all my coaching is based on psychology and science. That's it. And, and it's just, it's kind of my natural default, how my brain works, which is kind of funny, I think. But but it really is like we're really talking about psychology. And, and when it comes to giving salary ranges, the psychology is, is that they are going to hear the bottom of the range as something you will accept. And so that's why I just always default away from ranges. Um, we should just give one number. I hope that helps. I know that was pretty long winded. Hey, Jeff from Miami. First time here on your live. Watched a few. Very insightful. Amazing. Uh, we will always take new people. And, and you know, last week, and I, I want to follow up on last week. Uh, after my live two weeks ago, somebody told me to, to take a break, take two or three months off. I responded and I said, thank you so much. I'd really love feedback on why you think that. And then they did follow up uh, maybe yesterday or Sunday and said, Hey, like I'm telling you to take a break for you. Like maybe it'd be more impactful. Well, I think that probably in this session, one person's gotten the answer already that would help them. So if it helps just one person, I believe that's impact. And that's why I continue to go live. And I've been really transparent. These live sessions have, they used to be a hundred to 200 people in the live session, but that was 2022. Tech was hiring way more. It was just a different world, right? And I'm happy for every single person who shows up here 
participates, doesn't participate, but I'm here to help everybody. And I hope that just one good answer in these sessions is impactful. So thanks for being here. Hey, Jeff, I gave a face-to-face -face for a Google apprenticeship interview, data analytics. Your videos have been a great help. Any tips for the next face-to-face -face round and also make a series on the apprenticeship? Okay. Um, so I don't really know what happened in your first round or what your first round interview was. What I can tell you is um, the apprenticeship interviews tend to lean a little bit more behavioral. That's just classically and historically been the case. And that's going to be for almost any company because behavioral answers are going to be a little bit easier. You're likely a little bit more junior in your career if you're going after an apprenticeship. So um, they're not going to be quite as challenging. So continue to work on your best behavioral examples. Uh, that's a big recommendation. And then a series on apprenticeships. I'm going to say what I tell everybody, which is basically like, sure, it's something I'll consider. I just don't believe that there's much to say there. Um, and also, I really like to do content on stuff I know. And so I never hired for apprentices um, in my career. And so it's, I have some knowledge of it, but um, I always want to provide content that I know is 100% or as close to 100% accurate. Things are always changing. I don't always have all the information, but I would just leave it at that. But I have been asked on other occasions to do apprenticeship and internship uh, videos. And it's something that I'll definitely consider because I've gotten enough interest in it. Thank you. Brilliant and terrifying. I'm not sure what we're talking about, but I think some of the stuff that I talk about can be a little terrifying for sure. Of those, you had 10 internal referrals where they actually submitted me and I've actually heard nothing back. Isn't that odd? Yeah, it's odd. Um, that is uncommon. Um, yeah, and I would say you know, again, I, I'll, I'll be a little softer on my feedback. Like I don't really qualify referrals as true applications. I bucket those as referrals. An application to me is just like, you don't have any connection. Now I know when you're referred, you have to apply. Um, but I think in most cases, when people are putting out the big application numbers, they're just applying. They're not really getting referred. And Jim, you keep going with those referrals. You don't stop. We got to poke and push the people who we believe will help us at any stage of the process. And so if you're like, oh, I don't want to go back to these people again, do it. If you were in my shoes, Jane, what would you do? You'd probably push again. So Jane, I need to ask you for one more referral. I found another role that I'm interested in. Push, push, push. People want to help. And, you know, as our careers get longer um, and just life gets longer and we get older, what we recognize and, and understand is that oftentimes the people who end up helping and supporting us are the most surprising people. The people who you would expect to step up to the plate, they disappear, they don't help you when needed, but some random person comes in and they're like, they're like the hero of our story. And so um, just continue to push, okay? It is odd, but uh, it's a law of averages. Um, especially when it comes to referrals. And so keep pushing. Okay. No chat GPT will add same fluff to all recommendations, i.e. technical acumen. So Mark, yeah, it's a great opportunity to, um, it's a great opportunity to provide, whether it's chat GPT or Gemini or Claude with, a little bit of context and to be more specific to chat GPT, stop with the silly language. I don't like it. Make the language more casual. Stop with the technical acumen. I don't like the technical acumen. Let's remove it. Like I think that these AI systems do a great job of listening to what we're providing. Um, and so even like, let's say like I do a blog post a week and oftentimes I'll run my scripts through chat GPT uh, to help me narrow what's probably a five to 10,000 word script. 
um, down into 500 to 1,000 words. But a lot of it, I'm editing, I'm tweaking. It's just helping me create some of the core foundation. But a lot of it, I just end up writing anyway. Same with the LinkedIn recommendations, right? Like maybe it just helps you put together a couple of sentences. Um, I also like to do some funny stuff with LinkedIn recommendations. I'd say like, you know, for instance, I had a really good collaborative lead at Google. And I said, like, look up in the dictionary. You'll find a picture of his name's Roberto. You'll find a picture of Roberto in the dictionary under leader. Right. So like we just have these opportunities to be like a little playful with it, too. Um, you know, like I had a buddy, a uh, buddy of mine, Scott and I used to pull all these pranks at Google. So I would talk about like his pranks and like just like fun stuff like that. I think sometimes the recommendations, we can remove a little bit of the formality of it and have a little bit of fun with it. But yeah, we always got to check ChatGPT. Like <sighs> I just, to me, it's funny because just some of the, some of the overstating and use of words and stuff it's so consistent so you instantly know like wow chat gpt wrote that so um just something to know awesome hey jeff it's me once again hi a recruiter from google contacted me a few weeks ago to mention that a role i applied for is opening up and inquired and inquired and queried inquired if i'm still interested um there's been a hiring freeze since last year, but I've already completed all the interviews successfully. However, since my conversation with her, I haven't received any additional communication a few weeks ago. Okay, so we check in with graciousness and kindness. Now, I don't know if you've already checked in, but if you haven't, just follow up and say, again, my fake I feel like my fake recruiter defaults to Jane, where my fake interviewer is always Sue. And then we have Bob, who's not as friendly. Uh, but like if you're following up with recruiter Jane, just graciousness and kindness. Hey, Jane, I remain intrigued and interested in the role we discussed a few weeks ago. Just wanted to check in, see how things are progressing. Thanks so much. And I would send that message or, or something similar to it multiple times. Why? It's the poke. It's the reminder, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm available, I want it, right? And when we do we do the consistent pokes with graciousness and kindness, um, the likelihood that they follow up with us increases. People get frustrated. You'd be surprised at the communications I've seen in my time and, and the frustration when people don't hear back. And that's from somebody who really stayed on top of it. So uh just something to be thinking through i uh, hope that helps do you recommend including a cover letter when applying to google nope i do not uh, i do not believe that recruiters or sourcers read those cover letters ever um it's just a volume thing and and i don't believe they're valuable um in big tech companies I think it really it, it's role dependent and company dependent. But if if it's a really big company and they didn't ask for it, probably not because the person who's going to look at it is the recruiter. And let's talk a little bit about cover letters. Cover letters are old school, meaning like <sighs> cover letters used to be a way to introduce your audience to you. We don't need that anymore. We got LinkedIn. We got all sorts of, we got an online presence, whether we like it or not. And so I really feel like LinkedIn in some senses allows us to provide a little bit more color about ourselves and therefore the cover letter isn't necessary. People would argue against this, but anybody who's been in industry for a long time just knows you got three to five seconds to impress them on the resume, impress whoever that intended audience is. So cover letters, uh, they're not that impactful. Now, as we move up to more of the executive level, uh, that's where it can be a little different. Director, VP, C-level, at those levels maybe. But I always think if they don't ask for it, I'm not going to give it to them. And the systems that have a cover letter built in, I tend to default to whoever's running that HR department. It's like pretty old school and they haven't like updated to 2024 where like cover letters just really aren't necessary. Again, I'm 
I'm not here to say there's no scenario where a cover letter isn't going to be impactful. I just, in my opinion, I never read them. And that wasn't to be a jerk. I just didn't have the time. Like, candidly, just straight up this sheer volume of candidates coming in, the ability to read cover letters and sit back and have the time to do that was just, it was really a non-starter. Okay. Let's do a really, really quick, we're at the 30s. I'm going to do a super quick prompt on my services. Um, just today, till 11.59 Pacific time today, if you use the coupon code GREEN, 15% of, off of our AI tool, and then same on the interview mastery course, 200 bucks off. That will expire at 11.59 Pacific time today. I'm still doing one-on-one -on -one interview coaching, one-on-one -on -one negotiation coaching, and have introduced the one-on-one -on -one strategy session, which is resume and LinkedIn. Of course, we have that interview mastery course. We have the app. We have all sorts of other things um, for you, the user, free resources at practiceinterviews.com. The app, you can actually try a few questions for free as well. Uh, we have our Slack community at over 4,000 members. And hey, I, I got a negative comment on the Slack community. Somebody said that the quality had deteriorated and like wanted other platforms. and it was a really interesting communication item. Um, the quality hasn't changed. Uh, the engagement and interaction has gone down since, for example, 2022, when we just had such a robust hiring market. It's not quite the same anymore. Um, but our Slack community you can always get your questions answered there when I'm not live. So I always recommend it. And you can, again, find that at practiceinterviews.com. Scroll to the bottom and you'll find our Slack community. Okay, let's get back to it. Where was I? Okay, let's do this one. The first round was based on hypothetical. Explain internet to somebody who's new to it. Awesome. Can you prov can you provide for data analytics as my can you provide for data analytics as my recruiter told me to focus in on data gathering, manipulation, and KPIs? One hundred percent. What you want to do is you want to take that apprenticeship job description and include those details of data analysis, data gathering, manipulation, and KPIs. Throw it into ChatGPT, Gemini, Claude, again, whatever your preferred Gen AI tool is, and ask it to create questions based on those concepts. Um, so the best way to practice is to let these systems create questions for us. Right now, it's not all about the questions. It's really about the exercise of going through the practice over and over and over again. These are great opportunities in our careers to get these amazing opportunities, make great money, et cetera. Um, so I always want to leverage those tools. Also, on my YouTube channel, um, I've done a ton of stuff on how to leverage AI for the job interviews. I definitely recommend watching those videos as well. Some recruiters have told me CL don't get read and too many people submit applications under deep, different email addresses. So the system is just flooded. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's an application numbers, right? So for anybody watching, like if you want to do a cover letter, okay, nobody should stop you from doing a cover letter. Do people read them? Not really, not really, but you might get that one diamond in the rough who's willing to take the time to read it but yeah especially again big tech so if we're looking at any of the big tech companies or just companies that get a ton of applications cover letters are unlikely to be read it's not to stop you and if you are going to write a cover letter my recommendation is just less is more a full page cover letter you're adding minutes to the review so you could just write maybe a five six sentence little blurb about yourself that can also be impactful uh, you're welcome. Sorry, caffeinating and hydrating real quick. If a company hasn't made a decision in over a month, but continues to update you that there has been no decision, do you just give up? Um, Mark, I think you've hung out with me long enough to know that I uh, Giving up isn't really in my, uh, it's not really in my headspace. Um, and so here's what's happening. There, well, let's just, let's think through it. Let's talk through it. So when they continue to give you updates, 
that means you interviewed well. It means they liked you. Uh, I would not continue to update somebody who I was not interested in. It's just a complete waste of my time. So they like you. They're interested. There's a couple things that are potentially happening. Maybe, first of all, you were first. That's a high likelihood that you were first or really early. And they liked you, but they wanted to talk to others. That doesn't mean your interview performance was negative. Sometimes they just like to stack rank. They like to see multiple people. There could be some internal things going on that we'll never have insight into in terms of the role, what they're looking for, the role responsibilities, requirements, those can change. Sometimes companies will interview a bunch of people and then they'll decide, oh, actually, we need something else. But no, if they continue to update you, stay with it. And by the way, you don't need to do much. Now, if they start to go dark on you, then you can check in every week or two and just say, hey, still interested, still checking in, et cetera. Um, so all sorts of opportunities, okay? <clears throat> awesome, you are welcome. <clears throat> hey, Jeff, thanks for sharing great interviewing tips. You have a great pulse on the job market. Thank you. Um, the job market's tough. I mean, I think, again, Obviously, this is this is totally like every time I show up to these lives, I know we have a global audience, which is so cool. Um, I've coached clients in over 30 countries, which to me just like still blows my mind. Some of the countries I've coached in it just it's so cool. Um, but I think in the US, like some of the job reports, it's kind of fake news. And <clears throat> we are just seeing overall more competition for the really elite and tough roles. That's always been the case, but now it seems even tighter, especially with a lot of great talent being laid off from some of the elite companies. So it's it's a tight, it's like the job reports again in the US or in other countries that can come across as positive, but for some of the tougher jobs, it's it's remained tighter than ever. Um, so, and I try to keep as up to date as I can. And, and I look at the trends of my business too, right? Like, Who's showing up to the lives? How many views am I getting on YouTube? How much engagement am I getting on LinkedIn? And usually those ebbs and flows show some of what's going on in the job market as well. Been using and loving the interview practice tool. I know you've used it quite a bit and I, I really appreciate you being one of our super users. What is an acceptable score? My tool is tough. Uh, I'm tough right? Like if you ever get coaching from me, I, I'm, I'm super tough. The tool is trying to prepare you for the toughest interviews in the world. And so I think any answers that are hedging 50 or above the scale for anybody who hasn't used the app, it's one to a hundred. You just want to see improvement over time. So how do we do that? How did I build the tool to help you improve over time? I want you to focus in on the analytics and find out where are the weak spots. Is your weak spot in solutions on hypothetical answers? Is your weak spot in results on the behavioral answers? Because what the analytics are trying to show is what are the areas that need the most work? And so you always want to go back and rework those parts because that will help your overall scores. But definitely... As you get into like the 70s and a score of 80 on my tool, you'll crush the interviews because nobody's going to be that close. Um, not, it's unlikely. So should you see 100 scores? No, I, I figured out how to get hundreds on the behavioral side. I'll tell you, I've never gotten a 100 score on my hypothetical questions, which I know maybe you're saying, Jeff, like you should be able to get a 100 score on your hypothetical answers. But I always want to see opportunities for improvement. So again, while I've been able to kind of get that perfect score on the behavioral side, on the hypothetical side, I haven't been able to. Um, and we have uh, tweaked the scoring a little bit and we'll continue to tweak the scoring to maybe make it a little more user friendly. Um, I think it's also important that I'm just providing a little bit more of that information up front when you get into the app to let you know that the scoring is going to be really tough because I want to make sure that people are using the tool and improving. And so if the scoring is really easy, um, I did, I used one tool that gave me like, it was on a scale of one to 10 and I, I got a 10 out of 10 and like something that was just, I gave like the worst answer in the world. And I just wanted to be tougher 
Uh, and now I'm just getting long winded, but I, I hope that I hope that answers your question. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Have a nice treat from my side. Thanks for the content you provide. Absolutely. Hey, Jeff, videos are really helpful. The way you explain is awesome. Awesome. Uh, I have an RRK for a CE on data management. Could you provide some info around that and upskilling on AI? Yeah, so the CE, um, RRK, uh, whether it's data management or any other facet or area, it, it's really going to have three things in, in the first RRK, the RRK interview. There's actually two RRKs for that. There's an interview and then a presentation. Um, but in the interview... Uh, it's going to focus in on three types of questions, straight technical questions like how does Netflix work in the cloud? Now, of course, you'd answer that probably with a little bit more of a data lens. I still really like when people clarify even straight technical questions because I don't know what they want the focus area to be. So I still kind of follow CFAS on technical questions, but you're definitely going to get straight technical questions. You're definitely going to get behavioral questions and hypothetical questions. So some of the ways to prepare and upskill for RRK is like, if you're not implementing Google Cloud technologies in your hypothetical answers, you're not building strong enough connectivity with your interviewer. You do not need to know the ins and outs, but if it's a data management question, you might say, well, we want to make sure that their utilization of BigQuery is fantastic. We might dive deeper into analytics by utilizing Looker, like just bringing in a couple of GCP specific technologies from the data side when building your solutions can be really helpful. Remember, whoever you're interviewing with is working with GCP daily and they're just going to be so familiar and it's just going to build some connectivity. But the RRKs, you got to be ready for everything. Okay. So it's really about practice as much as you can. I uh, hope that helps. If you have more questions, let me know. I see the large tech companies moved away from remote roles. Yep. From my searches, it's harder to find them due to less listing and lots of applicants. Will fully remote make a comeback? Nope. I don't believe so. Now, of course, I can say whatever I want and then, you know, COVID, the next COVID comes out or something worse or like there's just always like economic, political, um, environmental challenges like that we're going to face in our lifetimes and none of that's predictable. I think some of the challenge is that the decisions for RTO return to office, um, they're typically being made without thinking that people have different learning and work styles. Everybody operates differently. If I was in a full-time corporate role, I'm the type of person who would thrive in the office. Put me at home, am I going to be more productive? No, probably not. I probably will be less productive. I'll probably get up to go to the bathroom and I'll start cleaning the bathroom, right? Or like I'll go to do something and I'll get distracted by something like a household chore or something I need to do around the house. So for me, I'm more productive in the in the office. But for other people, for 50%, they're more productive working from home. They don't want to commute. I didn't, I'm not going to say when I was in the Bay, I loved the commute. The traffic up there was absolutely insane, but I used my commute time to learn. So I wasn't really that opposed to the commuting time because I was like, oh, this is my learning time. If it's an hour, an hour and a half per day, like I'm just going to be learning. So I'm upping my game. Um, but I just, I don't see them going back to remote, even though I kind of feel like it should be employee choice. Like, where do you perform better? Because some people are going to be really transparent like me and say, hey, I perform better in the office. And in big tech companies, why would I want to go into the office every day at Google? Uh, I don't know, maybe because the food's amazing. I can use the free gym. I can sit on a comfortable couch and do my work. I can interact with people I like. I can play a little ping pong, a little pool, like so for me, I love being, I loved being in the office, um, but I don't see that default going back to remote. I see it going the other way. Um, so I think you will see way less roles that are just straight up remote. They exist, but they're far, few and far between. And here's one sneaky trick. 
let's say for instance you live in uh you live in new york and you want to stay in new york and the role is in atlanta i would say interview for the role get them to love you and then at the end if they say okay we got to talk about relocation say I remain really excited and enthusiastic about this role. Um, at this time, I do not believe I'm going to be able to relocate, unfortunately. Would you consider opening this up to remote? And sometimes, just because of what we've been through over the last handful of years, they actually will. This used to be in my advice actually pre-COVID, and I haven't stopped. Like, Get them to love you for a non-remote role. Get them to change it to remote. Is that a lot to go through and maybe they don't change it? Sure. Uh, but I still think sometimes it's worth trying. I hope that helps. I know that was super long-winded. Okay. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. I don't think I recall how many examples you believe one should have on the bit on the behavioral side when interviewing with high tech it's a great question and there's no really like there's no set rule so i think having like five to ten great behavioral answers is awesome but what are we really going to focus in on we got to focus in on our best our absolute best stuff so what does that mean that's three to five examples, our best projects, initiatives, programs, just things we implemented, things we did. You got to start with those because those are the stories you're going to want to talk about the most. Why? One, because they're going to be robust. And two, because it's going to be easy to pivot. You probably can repurpose your best examples to answer a ton of different questions. So three to five of those. But then you have to be ready for the more common types of behavioral questions too. Like, tell me about a time when you had a conflict. Tell me about a time when you failed. You have to have standalone examples for very, very common behavioral questions. So that's where, okay, how much do you want to build for just those? But one of your great accomplishments, you might have had a failure in there. You might have had a conflict in there. Um, I always kind of went in with a rule of like five to 10 great examples. And usually that's enough. Now, one quick note, if you're going to go interview at Amazon, that's not enough. You need 20 to 30 to 40 examples and they all need to have happened in the last two years. So you got to know the company too. Now, Amazon is definitely an outlier. They look for examples within the last two years and you're going to get 30 to 40 behavioral questions in the interviews. Maybe that number's a little high, but it's you're going to have to have 20 to 30 examples for them. Um, so it does depend on the company too. Uh, but just the more, the better. The other thing we can do to jog our memories is to throw our resume into ChatGPT and say, what do you think I should be talking about for my career? Find 20 items for my resume that I should be talking about. And then you may think, oh, I didn't even think to use that as an example. It jogs your memory. And here's the other thing ChatGPT can do on the behavioral side. This is crazy. You can provide your answer, like you can type out your behavioral answer. If you go to practiceinterviews.com, I have a free shell uh, doc where you can build out your answer. You can throw that an written answer in a ChatGPT and say, what did I miss? What did I forget to include? And then all of a sudden, it's providing details that you likely took because it understands the gaps. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. And obviously use the AI tool as well to help with your prep. Um, I hope that helps. I finished high school and worked at a big wall street bank as a trade support analyst. Now working as a project manager in big tech for five months. What kind of options do I have in this job market? Well, the good news is, is that, um, First of all, any analytical work and project manager work, I mean, it's so transferable. So, so it's a great foundation. I think anybody who can dive in and do analysis and look at the data and parse data, it's critical because you know how to look at information, but then all <clears throat> data analysts or support analysts or whatever it is, are going to have to communicate with people too. So you have to have the information and, and analysis skills. <clears throat> but you also have to have the people skills. Now I'm a little biased. I have some analytical 
uh, in my career too. So I think it really, really helped me. Um, and then the project management, the reason why I like project managers, program managers, product managers is because, um, you're pretty insulated and safe from AI. These are roles where you have to interact with people quite a bit. There's a lot of moving pieces. Um, so I really like those roles, but you have multiple options in the job market. Those types of skills are transferable and high school or college, like, look, the degree is becoming less relevant. Um, you know, the, the degrees and advanced degrees, the relevancy is going to continue to be less and less year over year. And so I hired multiple people in Google who didn't have a college education. It doesn't matter. I'm going to look at that experience more so than anything else. So I'd say you have a ton of opportunities, but something in the analytical or project management space, staying in that space is good. And then the last piece is with those two skills, maybe moving a little bit over to program management, which is just larger scale projects. Programs tend to be longer, um, longer in terms of timeline and then scope and scale tends to be bigger. Um, so th that's another option for you as well. Okay. We are 51 minutes in. We somehow naturally almost always hit the hour mark in these live sessions and sometimes longer. Uh, please, any and all questions are welcome. So I'm going to sit and kind of wait and see if any additional questions come in. While we're waiting on those questions, the focus area of our live session today is how to negotiate your job offer. And there's some foundational items that you've probably seen in my other videos, but we should talk about. The foundation of getting more money is graciousness and kindness. People will work harder for you if you're nice to them. Think about every relationship you have in the world. The people who are really nice to you, they're going to, they, you're going to put forth more effort for them and vice versa. So when negotiating, we always start with that foundation of graciousness and kindness it's also really important to get as much upfront data as you possibly can. Know the laws in your state or country. Should they be posting the salary range in the job description? If you ask for the salary range, do they have to provide it? Know those laws before going into those conversations. It's really, really helpful from a data standpoint. And it's important to know that if it is posted, that's a salary range. So like a Google salary range, that's nothing in terms of total comp because it's base, bonus, equity, sign on. So uh, worrying too much about the base being low, understand if it's a public company, if you're going to get equity, because that's really going to push the total number up. And then of course, as always, people know, I recommend a high anchor. Go big. You have to understand the company you are negotiating with to have a high anchor. High anchors can lead to rescinded offers if the company is smaller, they're unsophisticated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've seen these scenarios happen. They're very, very rare, um, but usually somebody's on a power trip, somebody's unhappy about something, and they can ruin people's lives. Um, so with that anchoring high, just always understand the company. If you're going after big tech, Google, Amazon, Meta, Apple, they're not going to rescind the offer because you go high. Okay. So always go baller with those companies. They'll do light threatening. Oh, we might need to rescind. We might need to give it to somebody else. They're not going to do that. You're their preferred candidate. So you can always anchor high and then work the script. Remind the recruiters, especially at big companies to advocate for you, partner with you because that's their job. Just a few tips. We can dive in more if we if we need to. Just passed the Google interview, but my current salary is but my current salary is well below the standard at Google. How can I negotiate my salary to ensure I'm not lowballed? Yes, yeah, so all you want to do is go right back to what I said, which is perfect timing. Anchor high. You are not putting anything at risk. I've negotiated over 500 offers with Google. They've never rescinded because of going high. And I even had a case where somebody, it was an L7 role and somebody negotiated $2 million a year, a USD. That's what they were asking for, $2 million a year. I didn't even get them half of that, but that wasn't the point. I didn't freak out that they asked for $2 million. I just wanted them to validate why. I 
simply stated to this candidate, I don't believe I can get you that number, but let me try. And I went back and I tried and I got a very strong offer for them, but it wasn't going to come even close to that, but I didn't freak out. So I would just say, go in, anchor high. Remember the biggest item that has flexibility always is equity. Bonus is non-negotiable, sign-ons sometimes, but equity, usually whatever the initial number is, that equity a lot of times can be doubled or more. And good luck. Again, Brad, it would depend on the company, right? So like, again, if you're going after like a Google offer and you ask for more, no big deal right? But it you just got to be careful. I had, so in my negotiation uh, history of all the people I've helped with negotiations, two offers have been rescinded, okay? Um, that we were not able to get back. Now, one, I just chuck it because the rescinded offer came when my client asked who the hiring manager was and what the title of the role was because they had been non-committal and they never were able to give this specific person the title role or who the hiring manager was. And then they just said, no, you're asking too many questions. So I don't even count that one. Now, the other one that was rescinded was a different story. We negotiated, they increased. They said, hey, I think we're at a stopping point. We said, okay, we're gonna make a decision. The recruiter granted us that time only to come back and said, no, you've you've negotiated too much. We're rescinding. In that specific case, we were not able to get it back. And I went all the way up to the chief level at that organization and told them that their process was shit and that this was a lead recruiter trying to implement their feelings on this candidate. And I, I reached out to that all the entire hiring team. I told everybody that they should basically be embarrassed. And, and like I had to be transparent that it was my client and we never got it back. So I really kind of counted only as one, but it, it is important to remember that you really got to listen to what the people are saying. So if it is a small company, even though it's not the greatest strategy, you might say, what is your negotiation philosophy? They should be telling you no company should ever rescind because you negotiate your offer. If you're a jerk, it's one thing. But if you just say, hey, I'm looking for X and they go, well, that's way too much. We rescind. That's just ridiculous. That just that person, whether it's a hiring manager, or recruiter, just wasted everybody's time. Right. So but with the smaller companies, just tread lightly. OK, just say, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about your negotiation philosophy? Because we just want to understand Hey, like if I negotiate, I'm not putting the offer at risk. Whew, I know that was a lot, but I that context hopefully helps. Okay, sorry, just caffeinating, hydrating. In my case, the recruiter told me the comp analyst told my recruiter that they've reached my limit for total compensa compensation for the role, even though I told her I have a competing offer. Did you provide that competing offer in writing? It doesn't mean that just because we have competing offers, it doesn't always mean that the company is going to match that. It doesn't always mean that. And here's the funniest thing about competing offers. Obviously, most of my clients, we work on negotiation at the elite companies, but a lot of times those competing offers hurt. They don't help. So whenever you provide a competing offer, make sure that you've seen the other offer first to know that it's driving up the other offer. Um, but sometimes they need to see it in writing. I don't know if that's the case. Let us know. Had my first G interview ever for a non-technical PGM role. Didn't pass. Very bummed. Should have asked for more prep time. Recruiter said to focus on giving more details. Any suggestions for next time? Most of the advice out there online, on Google, like if you were to right now, if anybody were to Google, how long should my behavioral answer be? 90% of the data is going to say one to two minutes. It's terrible advice. I mean, again, I like I anybody could argue against it, but I just as one minute, 
what can I learn about you specifically what you did and how you did it in one minute? I can't, I can't learn anything about you. So really take that strong advice from the recruiter. What is the level of depth in your answers? Are you on the behavioral side, walking them through how you planned, researched, looked at the data and had conversations? Are you talking them through the details of how you tested and executed on that item? Are you talking them through the details of how you launched, presented and documented those pieces? And then are you providing the details of the great results and backing that up with numbers? Interviewers connect to specificity not this week, but the previous week, I did a video on visuals and adding visual details to your answers. It's one of the most overlooked items in all interviews is details and details that are backed by visuals. So definitely something I want you to focus in on next time around. Of course, take all the time in the world to practice. And of course, app.practiceinterviews.com. If you want to just check it out for free, you can try a few questions there for free. I hope that helps. Once you're in at Google, can you renegotiate comp on promotion to new level example L5 to L6? How lu lucrative can this be? Uh, you cannot negotiate promos. Um, that 0% of the time. I've never seen that happen. Of course, there's probably an outlier that I'm not aware of, but no, promos are non-negotiable. The increases are going to be significant. Um, your base is, on a promo, your base is likely to go up 20% or more um you're when you get pro mode usually you're going to get a very very strong refresher and five to six your baseline target bonus goes from 15 to 20 percent so the ranges within that bonus change too so you could get like a pretty standard like meets expectations and still get like a 23 24 25 percent bonus so um it's going to be really lucrative. Anytime you get a promo, it's going to be a big jump, but it's not negotiable. The video about visuals was a good one. Okay. Thank you for that. I just, I cannot emphasize enough to the audience that's here. If you're not implementing visuals throughout your answers, they're not paying attention. If I'm just sitting here and I'm saying, you know, ah, it's such a good dinner last night. The food was really good. You know, I was watching a really good sporting event. You're just like, you have no visual of what the heck I'm talking about. But if I told you that I watched the Boston Celtics play last night while eating pepperoni pizza, and I was doing it at this cool sports bar that had TVs and surround sound, you can picture it. Picture me eating pepperoni pizza, picture me watching the Boston Celtics, picture me in a bar environment. It keeps your interviewers engaged. Visuals are absolutely key. And if you Google visuals and a job interview, there's so little content on Google that I created that video and it became the number one hit in a Google search within like two or three days because there was nothing else. Nobody else was even talking about it, but it is a critical thing. So thanks for that, Brad. I just really recommend that video. It's long. Remember, I'm low and slow. 2X me. You can get through that 16 minute video in eight minutes if you 2X me. Uh, something I always recommend. I'm incredibly slow, intentionally, but you can always 1.25, 1.5, anything to just speed me up a little bit. You are welcome. Is there a criterion beyond refresher stocks? Are you guaranteed refresher stocks even though you recently joined and have six months in the first calendar year? Also, how much increment in base? Okay, I need to go back here for a second. Um, yeah, so refresher stocks are only guaranteed if you started in the previous year. Um, but usually manager discretion, um, they're going to give you some as you start to hedge into any year. So let's take 2024. If you were to start in May of this year, we're starting to hit that cutoff line where maybe you're not going to get refreshers next year because they start to make those refresher decisions pretty early on, starting in like September. But um, it's not, recruiters use the wrong terminology on refreshers. They say you won't get them. It's just they're not guaranteed manager discretion. You can get them any start time. Um, 
but refreshers are a powerful item. And then increments in base, um, the merits used to be really strong, like six, seven, eight percent on a merit. That's a yearly uh yearly base increase um i heard this past year they were not as good one two three percent um but obviously most promo base increases are going to be about 20 percent plus it's going to be a, a pretty big leap overall okay we are an hour and five in again we're out of questions i'm just going to go in and kind of prompt into my outro my ending but if any additional questions come in while i'm chatting uh, happy to an answer any last minute questions so if anything is top of mind for you throw it in the comment section so just want to prompt on this one last time if you use the promo code green for app.practiceinterviews.com 15 percent off the app that's just today and then 200 bucks off the interview mastery course also using that coupon code green again that's just available till 11 59 pacific time today I'm still doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. One-on-one -on -one practice interviews remains the most popular. Um, obviously, one-on-one -on -one negotiation is pretty popular. And then over the last six months, lots of one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions. That's resume, LinkedIn, and networking strategies. Have the interview course. The app is trending really well. We will continue to improve the tool based on your specific feedback. We are not doing anything that is not based on the feedback of multiple users who are indicating this is going to be an improvement to the tool. It's going to make it better for me. Um, and so we always want feedback, so don't hesitate to give it to us. Okay. Quick last prompt <clears throat> is that next week is 156 live sessions. Why does that matter? It matters, and I, I have to double check the numbers on that, I'm pretty sure, but at 156 sessions, that's three full years of going live. To me, it's an accomplishment. Um, I have lasted on YouTube uh, longer than a lot of my com competition competitors, so I'm pretty proud of it. So I'm gonna do some sort of special giveaway next week. So definitely tune in next week. There's gonna be something fun that we'll give away. And I think that's it. If you like what I did today, smash that like button. If you've never sub subscribed, consider subscribing. I go live 9 a.m. Pacific time every Tuesday and new original content every Monday. Have a fantastic Tuesday and I'll be back next week. Thank you.